How's everybody doing today? Have you all had a good day? Good? Good. It's nice and uh, cool outside. few announcements for you. I want to remind everybody there is a men's and women's breakfast on Saturday morning at 8.30. Invite everybody to attend that. It should be about an hour long or so. And so, do you need to bring anything? Just yourselves and a smile. Amen. If you bring a frown, we won't let you in. We are going to take prayer requests and then we are going to get into the Word tonight. Um... So, first off, who's got them? Bonnie Gilbert. Okay, remember Bruce. Robin, Ron Briscoe, Wally, okay, remember Melody, Patsy Sullivan, Any other prayer request? Frances Clayton came through her hip surgery well today. So we want to continue to remember her as she recovers. She's been struggling with that for quite some time. Want to remember the lost and unsaved? Amen. All right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up these requests to you tonight, and we are thankful, God that uh, for what you have um, done and what you are doing. And Lord, we pray to your God for these requests this evening. And we thank you, Lord, um, God, that we know, Lord, that you can, you can answer each one of these prayers and each one of these requests. And we're thankful that we can come to you and bring these requests. And Lord, tonight we lift up each name up on here. I pray to your God for Bonnie Gilbert. Pray, Lord, that you be with uh, them. Pray, God, for Tim. I pray, Lord, for Bruce. I pray to your God for John Seals, for Rhonda Briscoe, Jim Liddell, for Melody. Patsy Sullivan for Francis. We pray for the lost and unsaved. We pray for those who are battling cancer and uh, Lord facing um, Lord recoveries from surgeries, those who are grieving over lost loved ones. And we just pray dear God a special touch upon each and every one of them. Pray Lord for those unspoken requests that are in our heart tonight. And uh, Lord, we just pray dear God you meet those needs and those circumstances. We pray dear God, Lord, for our nation tonight, for our state, for this world. We pray, dear God, Lord, we'd see many come to you in repentance and come to you seeking a relationship with you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. So, um, I don't know where I'm going to lead us in study next. So tonight is just kind of a fun night. And so um, we're going to have uh, a round of Bible trivia. And so, um, no, I'm just kidding. All right? Um, <laughs> I want to talk tonight about prayer. How many of you ever prayed before? Amen? How many of you pray every single day? Amen? Now, how many of you, um, are, how many of you have, uh, um, you were taught to pray by your parents? Anybody in that, that? Yeah? How many of you, one of your first prayers was, Lord, lay me down to sleep, bless my soul, my Lord, to keep? Amen? God is great. God is great. Yeah? And so I, I just want to talk to you some tonight about prayer, and then I thought at the end we could kind of maybe put an emphasis and pray together for a little while about some things. That'd be okay? Amen? Yeah. All right. And so um, we'll start off. Um, anybody have any idea how many prayers are in the Bible? You guys want to take a stab? 300? 365? No. Good guess, though. Anybody else? 1,000? Pretty good guess. 650 prayers are listed in the Bible. i got a list of them all if you want to read them. 
And so 650 different times in 66 books did we see God be prayed to or be talked to. Um, There are approximately 450 recorded answers to the prayers in the Bible. So close to 75% of the prayers prayed are answered. Sometimes they're not answered. You ever had an unanswered prayer? So I think a good question to ask about prayer is when did prayer begin? Anybody want to answer? After Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden? Pretty close, Jeff. Pretty close. Now, we don't see it as prayer there. Really, what do we see the prayer there as? As a conversation. First time prayer is mentioned in the Bible is Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. Um, so let's turn our Bibles there, if you will. We're going to take our time through these tonight. I'm in the NLT. It says, when Seth grew up, when Seth grew up, he had a son and named Enosh. And at that time, people first began to worship the Lord by name. I'm not sure what Genesis says there. Um, Genesis, or excuse me, uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 9 says, Afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother? Where is Abel? Um, he says, I don't know. Cain responded, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's guardian? You remember that conversation that God had with uh, Cain after he killed Abel? But really, it probably goes back earlier than that, as Jeff um, so ably said. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, and we see the story of the fall, and you look at verse um, beginning of verse 8, it says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Greatest question in all the Bible found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you who you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why, I, that's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the animals domestic wild. Now, he goes on to say in verse 16, he says, Then I said to the woman, I, Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. You will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Verse 17, and he said to the man, this is God speaking, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from the dust and to the dust you will return. And so really the first conversation that we ultimately see comes in Genesis chapter 3 and man talking to God. And would you guys agree with me tonight that when we pray it should be a conversation with God? Amen? Um, Now we see as we read that dialogue in Genesis chapter 3 that it seems more of a um, conversation than it does a prayer. But we can also see things from this. First of all, we see signs of reverence, don't we? Because the very first thing that they do when they hear God walking in the garden, what do they run and do? They hide. Why? Because they have to be a certain way before God. All right. Now they are, they realize that they're naked. The very first time they ever realized they were naked. And there they have to go and they have to hide themselves because they're shame. They, they revere God. Not only do they revere God, but there's a certain fear. Why do you hide from somebody? Because you are afraid, right? And so they were afraid of God. There was this reverence that they had for God. And so God said, hey, where are you? And they said, well, we went and hid. We went and hid because we were naked. And then God asked them that great question in verse 11, who told you were naked? And what do you see next in the prayer? You see confession. See, God knows who they are. He asked them the questions and what do they do? They confess. Because really in a way of praying, the very first prayer we pray is that prayer of what? Confession, right? God, this is who I am. I'm a sinner. I need saved. 
That prayer of repentance, Lord, I need you. And so there they are. They begin to repent. Notice Adam, his repentance isn't really that he's sorry. It's that he's sorry that he got caught. And then what does he start doing? He starts blaming, doesn't he? And he's, he starts, he's like, it's, it's the woman's fault. You gave me to her. She gave it to me to eat. But yet, there was consequences handed down during the conversation. First to the serpent, then to the woman, then to the man. And so we see this kind of birthing of a conversation with God. Now, before we go any further, let's just grab the enormity of this. God, who created the heavens and the earth, created the suns, the moons, and the stars, who created trees and animals and seas and oceans and mountains and valleys and all the good things that He created. He created all the animals. And then in day six, He created man. He sits back after that and He says, you know what, I can do a little better. He makes Adam fall asleep. He takes the rib out of Adam. He makes Eve. He, he, he brings them together. He said, this is good. They name all the, all the animals are named, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's giving them directions that they should walk and be in the garden. We don't actually know the time that's lapsed from the time that, of creation to the time of the fall. But nonetheless, it's a period of time. And apparently God would come and walk with them of a day, of an evening. He would come and share with them. He would come and have an intimate time with His creation. So the God who very much spoke Him into existence, who created man and formed Him together, He would come and visit them on a daily basis. Isn't that pretty cool? God wants to have a relationship with us. And I believe it's a relationship through communication. Amen? I believe He longs for us to speak to Him. To talk to Him. In prayer, what we learn from prayer, we don't really ever think about. Where does this even start at? God, from the very beginning, was communicating with His creation. Every day He would come and communicate with His creation. Do you think He still wants to communicate with His creation? Yes. I think He does. And so, a lot about what we learn in prayer, at least what I learned about how to pray and the words you say, I listen to my boys often and um, my boys pray what I pray. Does that make sense? And so, you know, we have catch words and I, I, I pray every day. I, I, you know, I use the phrase uh, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Jack will be like, Lord, I pray you bless us from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet. But where did he learn that from? He learned it from his dad. And so a lot of what we learn about praying, we pick up from our parents, we pick up from our spiritual mentors, you might pick up from your pastor, you might pick up from a prayer partner, you may pick up, why? Because that's how we learn, we've learned this stuff over time. But really tonight I want to say, what does God's Word say about prayer? How does God's Word direct us to pray? Because more than anything, over my lifetime I've learned to copycat prayers, does that make sense? Until I finally absorbed, hey God, this is my conversation to you. It don't have to be, it don't have to sound great. Amen? I don't have to use big words. I don't have to use catchphrases. What I do have to do is share my heart and communicate with God. Amen? So, let's take a look. Um, the Bible records Jesus praying 25. The Bible records Jesus praying 25 different times in His earthly ministry. Now that's that it records. But almost every time we see Jesus have a big event, either before or right after, it's what, what is Jesus doing? He's alone by himself. He's praying. He made time every day, multiple times a day to pray. In the greatest trial of his life, we see some of the greatest prayers that Jesus prayed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible records his prayers unto the Father. Lord, will you let this cup pass from me over and over again? The Bible says he was so agonizing in prayer that even there was drops of blood that would come out of him, that he was literally sweating blood because he was so stressed in his agony of prayer. Um, and so, time and time again, we see Jesus taking time to pray, taking time to pray. As Christians, we can't really go any further. One of the things that we have to do is we have to make time to pray. I, I don't know how we can actually grow as Christians without making time to pray. I don't know how we can communicate the way we need to with God without making time to pray. And I say this because, by and large... There's something different between saying, Lord, bless this food today. Thank you for all of you done. In Jesus' name, amen. That is not a good prayer life. Now, should we be thankful for our food? Yes. Yes, we should. I think we should take time to pray. But ultimately, we need to take time to really converse with God. Amen? I just put it like this. If your children came in and they didn't have anything else to say to you, but hey, thanks for feeding me today, mom and dad. 
Would you be okay with that? I mean, as teenagers, I'm learning you get that a lot, but nonetheless, you want to have a relationship, right? You want to have a conversation with them. And ultimately, God desire, desires a conversation with us. So as Christians, we have to make time to pray. I mean, we have to set aside time to pray. We set aside time for everything else. We set aside time for sporting events. We set a time, uh, we set aside time for, for eating. We set aside time for work. We set aside, we set hours and we play on phones and we play games. We, we have to create time to converse with God. Amen? I mean, it's just, it's imperatively important that we do that. If you ask yourself, Lord, how, how come you're not moving in my life? Ask yourself, do you really pray for God? Have you really conversed with Him? Hey, people say, well, I, I pray at stoplights. That's great. But when you're praying at stoplights, you're still waiting on the light to change and your mind's going somewhere else. But when you sit, you consecrate out, you put a place where you can go in your closet, in your room, in your office, in your backyard, in your tree stand, wherever you're at, and you make that time about you and God, not nothing else. You turn your phone off. You tell your family, hey, I need some time. Give me 10, give me 15, give me 20, give me 30 minutes, give me an hour. Whatever it is, you have to make a consecrated effort, a concentrated effort to spend time alone and pray. Amen? All throughout Scripture, we see every biblical character would take time alone to pray. Alone to pray. Um, and so we see that. Um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he mentions prayer 41 times in his epistles. That's a lot, all right? If you mention something, if you see something mentioned 41 times, you need to pay attention to it. Amen? Although, what else does he mention? He mentions prayers, prayer reports, prayer requests, exhortations to pray. And those 41 times, that's what he, he's talking about. Hey, do you have prayer requests? Listen, this is what we prayed about. This is, this is the result of it. Time and time again, he talks about prayer. Although prayer can be done from any bodily position, the Bible lists five specific postures on how to pray. Amen? And so, the, now listen. Almost every one of these listed is going to encompass what we do. But let's turn to these scriptures and look at each one of them, okay? And so, first turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Verse 18. So this is, in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, the Davidic covenant is happening, all right? And so David is going in to give a prayer of thanks. And look what the Bible tells us. It says, Then King David, he went in and sat before the Lord. He sat before the Lord. And so what's his posture? He's sitting, right? How many of you sit when you pray? It's a good thing, right? Um, when you show a sign of sitting, what is that? When you sit in somebody's presence, what does that show you a sign of? You're being comfortable, right? If somebody invites you in, they say, "Hey, will you please what? Sit down." They're glad for your presence. Um, you don't want anybody to sit down that you don't want to stay for a while, right? <laughs> Amen. They're like, "Hey, don't worry, don't bother sitting down." All right. But if you if you sit, what are you what are you expecting to do? You're expecting to spend some time there, aren't you? You're, you're making yourself comfortable. David comes in, not in a disrespectful fashion. He's not probably laid out like, but he's sitting before the Lord. And you, we'll read part of his prayer. Who am I, O, o who am I, O sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? So immediately he takes this sign of respect and, and all about what God has done in his life, where God's brought him from and where's God's taken him. Turn your Bibles over to Mark chapter 11. So, in my version, it doesn't say nothing about standing here. 
So I must have been looking at something else. But anyway, let's read it nonetheless. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive sins too. Obviously, there's an implication there in one of these versions where he's, we catch this out that he is standing. And so we, we see him standing before the Lord. So what are two postures? Sitting and standing. Next is kneeling. Second Chronicles chapter 6. Is it? Okay. I figured it was. So, Solomon's finished the temple. Chapter 6, verse 13. Now Solomon had made a bronze platform seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet high, and he placed it at the center of the temple's outer court. He stood on the platform, and then he knelt in front of the entire community of Israel and lifted his hands toward heaven, and he prayed. We see two postures there. One is kneeling, but he's also got what? Got his hands raised. Have you ever seen people pray that way? They pray with their hands raised. Um, and so we see, at this point, we see four different ways. We see sitting, standing, kneeling with your hands rose. Um, in Mark, we won't read the rest of these, but in Mark um, chapter 14, verse 35, let's flip over there, or Matthew 26, 39. Let's go to Matthew. My Bible sword drill here tonight. Your page is turning. Buttons being clicked. <laughs> Matthew 26, 39. He says he went on a little further and he bowed with his face to the ground. This is talking about Jesus. He's in the garden. So what does he do? He's in a position of great and utmost respect. Typically, when we see a person kneeling with their face to the ground, it's usually in a form of agony or despair. Right? Anytime we see that, it's this troubling moment. Would you be willing to say this is one of the most troubling moments of Christ's life when He's in the garden? And He bows in His face before ground, humble as He possibly can. That's a humble position, right? Amen? I mean, if somebody comes to get on their face, listen, that's a humble position. Um, and then 1 Timothy 2.8, we see uh, Paul praying with his hands up again. Uh, we also saw that. And so there's six, five different five different postures where we see people praying from sitting to standing to kneeling to on the ground with their face to the ground with their hands up. So are there different postures to have when we pray? Yeah, there is. There is. Um, are there different times for these postures? Sure, sure. Um, there may be times where you just want to sit and be comfortable with the Lord and that may be the sitting. There may be times of all and respect where you're to the point where you're standing with your hands raised. There may be times when you are so agonized over what's going on in your life that you just literally are on the ground in that almost begging form, God, I need you. Um, other times when you have this, 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 this great reverence and you just want to kneel as one before a king. However God leads you to pray, notice the postures that we see throughout Scripture, that we see a lot of them and we see them do it randomly. Amen? So... Not only that, but there's also um, the question of how, how to pray, right? Amen? So, I mean, obviously you can pray pretty much in any position that you want to, but the question is how. And I know in my own life, one of the most difficult things that we have to ask is, I don't know about y'all, but when I have my prayer time alone, typically what I do is I come to my office, I close the door, I shut off my phone, it's just me and the Lord in the air conditioner. And what happens is, is I'll start to pray and the next thing I know I'll start thinking about something. Do you guys ever do that? And then all of a sudden you're like, man, I need to make that phone call. Been there? Amen? There's been times when I've decided to pray and the next thing I know I was asleep. Ever happened to you? Amen? And it seems like when I go to pray, there's a war that takes place, not necessarily a physical outside war, but one between my two ears. It's a mental war. Why? Because... 
Right then and there, I'm asking in a most awesome way to communion with God. But yet, my, the battle really being in my mind, are those problems similar for y'all? And so I think it's good. What I've learned in my life is to have kind of a guide through my prayer that I kind of, I take notes and I stair step in my life. And, you know, really, when you want to have an agenda, when you want to have a meeting, well, what do you do? You have an agenda. You have talking points. Do you ever make yourself notes? I have. When I pray, I've started making notes. I keep a journal. And I just, I, I almost write down, I, I need to talk to God about this before I go to talk to God about this. So that when I'm praying, because my mind, listen, it can go, be out the door. I can't have the phone around me. You understand me? Typically when I pray, I leave my phone in my truck or I put it in a mailbox outside my office. Why? Because if it's around me, what am I going to naturally going to do? I'm going to grab for it, ain't I? You got to get away of everything. And when you pray, I, I've ended up taking these talking points. Lord, I've got to talk to God about this. This is an issue I've been dealing with in my own personal life. I've got to deal with this. And, and we keep going. Jesus gives us the model prayer, right? So in Luke chapter 11, turn there. And we're going to add to this. So in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, one Jesus, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your kingdom be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And do not let us yield into temptation. We know the prayer of our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So let's just kind of dissect that a little bit and look at the literally what's, what's taking place in the prayer. The very first thing that he does, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's his first area of focus? God, right? That God's name be honored. The focus on His everlasting glory. That God, you're not talking to a mere individual. You're talking to whom? You're talking to God. God with a capital G. God who speaks and things happens. God who is above time. Who is outside of reality. God who has unlimited resources. Whatever you need to understand, you're talking to the greatest being Ever. There's nothing better than Him. And so, that, 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 first, that first thing that we see is that His name should be honored. It should be lifted up. Hallowed be Your name. Holy be Your name. That it should be set aside. That God's kingdom, the focus on His eternal will, His kingdom come, His what? Will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, should we pray our will? No. And frankly, sometimes that's really hard. Amen? And so we've got to explain to God, Lord, in my life, I've got to explain to God, am I, like I need to explain to God, but I explain to God, Lord, I think it should happen this way. And then I've got to realize, Lord, if you don't want it to happen this way, help me to understand your will, not mine. Because the Bible says His ways are what? They're better than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. Um, and so a lot of times... When we pray, we pray, Lord, we feel like this is how you should do things. We pray that over sickness. Amen? We pray that through trial and tribulation. and stru Lord, we feel like this is how you should do stuff. We pray it with relationships, with jobs. with Lord, we feel like this is how you should do stuff. But Jesus directs us, Lord, that we would pray His will, right? That we would seek out the eternal will. That our focus would be on what is God doing in this situation? And that we might better understand that. If I'm leading and guiding and directing an event, and, uh, you know, say I, I, I take the boys a lot of times, I'll bring the boys up here Friday and we'll set up tables for uh, the breakfast on Saturday morning. And right now, if we were to go up there, there's six circle tables up there. And if we put, right, put everybody in the church, six circle tables is going to be pretty crowded, right? And so 
Uh, the boys now, I'll, I'll tell them, I'll be like, listen, we need five circles, we need, we need five rows of three. And they know there's eight chairs around, and boom, 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 they'll, they'll let us go to town. But when I first got them putting up tables and chairs, they were like, I was like, no, I don't want that one there. And I, I would begin to move tables, and finally they looked at me and they'd say, Dad, will you just tell us what you want done so we can do it? And so what I started doing is I started getting that whiteboard, and I would draw out my vision for them. I'd draw out exactly where the tables and I'd draw the chairs and the chairs would be X's and I, boom, boom, boom. And when they had a problem, they'd run and look at that board and they'd run back and they'd set their tables up. See, what happened is they started learning what my will was, what my vision was for it. You understand what I'm saying? When you're getting God's word, when you start communicating with God, then you'll understand what his vision and his will is. Does that make sense? A lot of times we go in and Caleb, he, he would say, well, I think the tables ought to be here. I said, that's fine, but you're not the pastor. I'm the pastor. It's my vision. I'm not God. He's God. It's His will in our life. And so Jesus says, he, he, first He honors God, who He is, what He's about. And then He seeks out His, his direct will. Um, next, He recognizes the, that He's a provisional God. That He's a God of resources. That He's a God who gives. He, he exercises thankfulness in that same way. If we could stop, you, you know, I, I, it's kind of redundant, but, and you've heard it all your life, but if we could really stop and say, count the blessings that God's given us every single day, but we couldn't, we couldn't write enough. We, we couldn't, there wouldn't be enough paper to list what God does in our life. Every time you take a breath, God just gave you that breath. Everything that God just gave it to you. Why? Because He's such an awesome and amazing God. Let us be thankful for what God's done and Jesus, is, Jesus focuses on that. So he, he starts off, let His name be honored. Let His, let his will be done. The kingdom come, will be done here on earth. That provision is given. Next, notice the idea of what? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now this is huge. Almost, Jesus directs us that every time we pray, there be a time of confession. How many of you have sinned today? Amen? All of us, right? Should we confess those sins? Yeah. I mean, there should be a time of confession in our life. Uh, every day I have a time of, Lord, help me where I failed. One of the reasons why we should confess sin, and not so much as, Lord, I have sinned, but in my life, I think it's good. I found it good for me to name specific sins. Because when you start naming specifically where God has failed you, or, excuse me, wrong word. <laughs> When you start naming specifically where God, where you have failed God, what you ultimately do is you can start learning from those. Amen? So if I know I have trouble in a certain area, the next time that I, I come up with that, I have these fleshly urges or I have these thoughts or I, my mouth gets the best of me, I can realize there's warning signs that are ahead. I, I need to go a different route. And when I trip, it's important to find out where the block is, the rock that makes us, that makes us stumble. It's important to get up and dust ourselves off. And confession helps you do that. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, He lists forgiveness. But not only does He list that we should ask for forgiveness, but also that we should grant forgiveness. Now, this is, I mean... I gotta be honest with you. I tell people this all the time. Granting forgiveness is advanced Christianity. You wanna know why? Because it's hard for entry level. You gotta work your way up to this. Alright? If somebody was to hurt one of your siblings or, 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 or hurt a child or, yet God directs us to what? Forgive. It, it, this is a hard, it, it's a hard process. Especially, in my own flesh, like, when somebody's mean to me or mean to my family, my, my main, my main reaction is, I want to grab a hold of them and shake them, right? Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't consequences for people's sin, alright? I'm not saying that we've got to get rid of consequences. But when I learned that there, number one, Jesus said, if you won't forgive others, your father won't forgive you, alright? So that's pretty big. I'll start there. But secondly, you know what I've known about unforgiveness? Unforgiveness, it binds people. It, it keeps people from living the way that God wants them to live. It keeps them from having the relationships that God wants them to have. 
It binds them in ways that we can't even understand and we can't comprehend. And I have seen families literally destroyed because of unforgiveness. I've seen friendships uh, completely destroyed because of unforgiveness. And I'll hear these words, you don't understand what they did to me on the yesterday. And you're right, I may not. But I know what God commands us to do. And I know it's hard. Amen? I know it's incredibly difficult. We can look throughout Scriptures and we see times where forgiveness has to be offered. Esau, Jacob, David, Absalom. Time and time again, we see forgiveness that has to be granted. The greatest aspect, Jesus dying on the cross and Him saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing. Our fleshly, we want the revenge. We want the, ooh, we want to get back. We want to see the kill shot. But Jesus tells us to pray completely different. He says, not only should you seek confession and forgiveness, but ultimately, you need to forgive those who have trespassed against you. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. But it can be done. Last thing he says, not only that forgiveness is being granted, but also he focuses on deliver us. Deliverance. Deliver us from evil. Um, there's a future day um, of deliverance that will be provided in all of our lives. That day is, you know, kind of, we just got done out of Revelations. Behold, He comes. That deliverance is coming. Uh, that we will be delivered from where we're at into where He is. Um, and we need to be looking forward to that deliverance. Deliver us from evil. There's a focus on the future. God, You are coming back. Jesus, You are coming to take Your people back. And so we see this description, these five areas, from holiness and reverence to who God is, um, ultimately to His His will being done, His provision, forgiveness, and also deliverance uh, to where we will be. And so Jesus tells us, He models us, this is how you pray. Now, if you just write down those five things when you're going to pray, you're going to have a good time of prayer. Amen? Would you all agree? I mean, it's as simple as writing those five things down in my journal. Lord, you're awesome. Amen? You start by just telling God how great he is. Because he's great. All right? If you can't use the words, make up a word. You are phenomenally fantastic. Whatever it is, you describe and you give God reverence. You give God praise. Let us start there. Secondly, say, Lord, I've got a laundry list here and I've got a list of how I want things done and how I think they should be done. Amen? But Lord, I'm going to lay that down and I'm going to name these things to you and then I'm going to ask that you show me what your will is in these situations. Amen? So maybe say it like this, you're having complications with a relationship. It may be a marriage, it may be a child, it may be a friendship. Lord, I really want this person to come and apologize for what they did, own everything they did, and that they might realize and understand who they, and make their mistakes, and, and Lord, if you could just make them, and Lord, if they won't, will you just kill them? <laughs> but ultimately, Lord, I want you to show me what you want out of this relationship. Do you want me to love them through this? Do you want me to give them grace and mercy like you gave me? Amen? Lord, let me see your work. Let my dependence transfer from myself to God what you want me to do. So you start off with those two things, man. You've, you've given God reverence and you've focused on His will in every situation in your life. God, what is your will? Your finances, God, what is your will? Your job, God, what is your will? Your family, God, what is your will? Your church, God, what is your will? Our nation, God, what is your will? Sent, God, what is your will? Ask those questions. List them in your life and say, Lord, help me to understand what you're doing in this process. I, I can tell you all day, God, how I want it to be done. But that doesn't mean He's going to do it that way. Amen? How many times really has God worked it out just like you wanted Him to? It's very, sel very seldom, isn't it? Very seldom. Now, there are some instances, but very seldom. Not only that, you give Him that time of provision... Lord, thank You. Thank You, God. Thank You so much for health and clothes and cars and air conditioning and, 
and blue skies and padded pews and, and kids and, 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 and laughter and, and friendships and all the things that we have. Thank you, God. Thank you for, for refrigerators and lights that turn up and down and, and all the things that God gives us, man, because it's amazing. And every blessing comes from God. And then you just ask that question, and this is where it gets hard. Lord, I I need some forgiveness. Lord, where where am I dropping the ball? Now, you're starting to take personal inventory of your own spiritual life. We don't do this often enough, because if we did this often enough, we wouldn't look and act like we do. Amen? Lord, where am I not being obedient to Your Word? Where am I struggling? Is it, is it, am I lying? Am I stealing? Am I lustful? Am I committing adultery? Am I murdering? Do I have hatred in my heart? Am I jealous? Am I envious? Do I have gossip? What, what is it, God? And you start thinking about your life and you're thinking about your actions. You say, well, I can't, listen, you start, you, you know when you've done something wrong. It haunts you. And that conviction that God gives you, that's the Holy Spirit. Amen? And one of the greatest things you can do is say, God, I failed in this. Forgive me for this. Guess what He does? He forgives. You say, well, I don't know if He'll forgive me. Let me help you out. He will. He will. And then you look and you say, God, who am I not forgiving? Who do I avoid at the grocery store because I don't want to see them because I don't like what they are? Amen? Who... Who in my church do I, I sit on the other side because I, I don't want to cross hairs with them? Amen? Lord, who, who in my family do I not want to talk to because, man, you don't understand what they're like and what they did. And you know, notice, you know, every time we see, there's a difference between being giving forgiveness and being best friends. Amen? Did you notice that? God didn't, I mean, it isn't, sometimes it happens. But when you forgive somebody, does that mean you have to be their best friend? No, it means you have to release them. Release them. You say, well, they didn't say they're sorry. They don't have to. Your forgiveness shouldn't be determined by whether they're sorry or not. You just got to ask for, give forgiveness. And so, he, he, and then ultimately deliverance. Lord, I want to be delivered from this. Those five things, if you just start your prayer life with those five things, man, watch out. God's about to do something in your life that's enormous. He's about to draw you closer than you've ever been. Now, I'll finish this tonight, and then we'll just maybe have have a time of prayer because I think it's good. Um, the Bible lists at least nine main types of prayer. Okay? Now, we've covered how Jesus has told us to pray, but throughout Scripture, we see some specific kinds of prayers. Amen? I said amen. amen. Okay. By the way, the first time we see amen, it's Deuteronomy chapter, Numbers chapter 5, verse 22. It means so be it. All right, never mind. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 5. Hebrews. James. First one we I want to talk to about a prayer of faith. Beginning in verse thirteen, it says, Are any are you any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. So if you're suffering hardships, what should you do? Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in what? Faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other, so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So, when somebody's sick amongst us, what should we do? Pray. What do we pray for? 
ultimately healing God's will. I think God's will is to heal everybody. Ultimately, maybe not on this earth. It may happen in heaven, you understand. But God's going to get everybody better. Um, but when we pray, we pray in faith, believing that God, what? That, that God can, that He's able, right? Um, I, I, one of the things about Stephanie's mother, is I think her whole sickness in my pastorate was to help me and Stephanie better understand that no matter what the doctor says, we still pray for healing. I mean, I, I've literally, I, I, with the families now, I go in and, and I ask people, I said, hey, how do you want me to pray? I, I, let, let me, you tell me how you want to pray. I mean, if they're near door death, listen, first of all, there's nothing wrong with dying. Amen? I, I mean, dying is, is, listen, you're going where God's called you to be. If you're right with the Lord, I mean, you've got a glimpse of glory. I, I've, I figure if we get somebody back, they're going to slap us when they get back. You know what I'm saying? Like, what are you doing down here praying? I was there. <laughs> so, obviously, if somebody's lived a long, solid life and you look at their family and you say, how do you want me to pray? Well, Pastor, we want you to pray that God take them home on wings of glory. All right, let's go. There's been other times with Stephanie's mom, she wasn't ready to lose her. And when the doctors came out and said, hey, there, we don't know what else to do. All right, well, we just... You look at my wife, and she was in tears. She's sitting there, and she, you know, we decide, hey, we're just going to keep... Until God closes the door, we're just going to believe that He can. And I think that's that prayer of faith. God, I believe He can. Sometimes I've seen God do it. Other times God's chosen to take Him home. I, I, I wish I could make sense of that. I can't, but all I know is that He's God, and He's, he's in control. But I have faith to know that He can do it. So the first prayer is pray that prayer of faith. Secondly, um, in Acts chapter um, 2. All the believers, in verses 42, all the believers devoted themselves, alright? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, alright? to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. You know, a lot of people say, well, the church, you don't have to go to church to be, to be saved, and you're right, you don't. But throughout the New Testament, God uses the church. The church, the body of people, that they would gather together, that they would pray, that they would listen to study uh, from, their, from, from their, their apostles, their teachers. Um, then ultimately, that they would pray together. It's good to pray together. Amen? I mean, we should spend more time praying together. Let me pray with you. On Monday nights, man, I love Monday nights. I can't say enough good things about Monday nights. And you know what we do? We just I used to call out names, just different things now. I open in prayer and people stand up and they just they pray as God leads them what's on their heart. You know what we do? We agree with them. It may be about their child. It may be about the country. It may be about a relationship. It may be about a lost loved one. But what they know is that when they're praying, there's a body of believers around them that are agreeing with it. It's good. Why? Because it's scriptural. It's biblical. Not only should we pray in faith, but we should also pray in agreement. Philippians 4, 6. This is what it says. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. It's a prayer of request. Is it okay to take your good needs to God? Yeah. How do I know? Because Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, take your needs to Him. You got a need? Take it to the Lord. Let us pray. Take it to the Lord. Um, one of the greatest things, I think, um, when somebody says, hey, you know, I, they might have a need for physical healing. They may not have a need for something spiritual, something emotional, something mental, something physical, something financial. One of the greatest things we can do is don't don't just say I'll pray for it. Just stop and pray for it. Hey, let's pray to the Lord. God, I need this. If we really believe that He has unlimited resources and that He can, tell Him what you need. Now, there's a difference between needing something and wanting something too, by the way. Amen? Amen. He'll meet your needs. He probably won't meet your wants. All right? He'll meet your, he'll meet your needs for sure. Um, Psalm 95. We don't have to turn here because we've already talked about this one. It's a prayer of thanksgiving that we would pray thankfully. Uh, turn over to Acts chapter 13.
Verse 2, one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them away. Um, we see this prayer of, of, of worship, this prayer of, um, of, of, of being reassured of what God wants them to do. It's a, uh, it's, it's a prayer of, of, ded- of dedication, of dedicating yourself to where you need to be and to where God wants you to be. Uh, have you ever felt like you had a calling on your life? You felt like God wanted you to do something certain, something specific? Don't just guess. What does God say do? Pray about it. We, we see these prayers. Lord, give us will. Give us direction. Uh, give us dedication. Um, turn your Bibles over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Matthew 26, we see a prayer of concert, consecration. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm almost done. I'm near the end. I'm rounding the finish line. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. In Romans 8, it says the Holy Spirit does what for us? Intercedes on our behalf. Paul gives that same direction to believers and for other believers in 1 Timothy 2. He says, well, you know a brother or sister who's hurting, what should you do? Intercede for them. Go to the throne for them. Fill in the gap for them. Stand in the gap for them. Um, there's been times in my life when I know people were specifically praying for me at specific moments and specific times. You know what they were doing? They were interceding for me. You ever had somebody intercede for you? They stood in the gap for you. They held up your arms like Aaron and her. They were your supportive. And, and listen, one of the greatest things is, man, is when somebody comes and tells you they're praying for you and you know they're praying for you, man, glory to God, amen? Uh, listen, you, you just want it. Thank you for interceding. Thank you for standing in the gap for me. When you think you're left and undone and nobody's there for you, man, there's that one person standing in the gap. There was this old song, there's uh what's that comedian's name? Shonda Pierce. And at the end of her, my grandparents used to listen to this, and at the end of her, she talked about how her mom would pray for her every night. And she sang that song, Somebody's Praying. You remember that song, Somebody's Praying? Somebody's interceding. And you think in your life, Somebody's prayed you through. Somebody's interceded for you. When you didn't think you were going to make it, somebody stood in the gap for you. Somebody cared enough about you when you were lost and wavered. They stood in the gap for you. God commands us to intercede for other people. Amen? Find somebody. Intercede for them. Psalm 69. I like this one. A psalm we could also view as a what? Prayer. Look how he prays. Save me, O God, for the floodwaters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire and I can't find a foothold. I'm in deep water and the floods overwhelm me. I'm exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me. Those who hate me without cause outnumber the hairs of my head. My enemies tried to destroy me with, what, with lies, demanding that I give back what I didn't steal. Oh God, you know how foolish I am. My sins cannot be hidden from you. Don't let those who trust in you be ashamed because of me. Oh sovereign Lord of heaven's armies, 
Don't let me cause them to be humiliated, O God of Israel, for I endure, endure insults for your sake. Humiliation is written all over my face. Even my own brothers pretend they don't know me. They treat me like a stranger. He goes on and on. Listen, David, when he's praying this, well, what is it? It's this prayer of despair. You ever get to a place where your heart just can't take anymore? Amen? Where you just feel beat up on every side? And you know what David's praying? Lord, I, I just need God. That, that prayer of, Lord, here I am. That, that prayer of despair, of almost weeping, of almost sorrow. Lord, this is me. I'm praying. One last one in Psalm and we're done. Psalm 51. Maybe the greatest one. David wrote this one after his uh, a prophet came to see him named Nathan. And Nathan said, Thou art the man. David had fallen deep in sin. God shows up and God shows up through Nathan and he convicts him of his sin. And we see this prayer of repentance in Psalm 51. And I'm telling you, this is we see this prayer of brokenness and a contrite heart. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great, great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my, mo my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Pure my, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from Your presence and don't take Your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of Your salvation and make me willing to obey You. Then I will teach Your ways to rebels and they will return to You. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of Your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise You. You do not desire sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not direct, reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. Last we see that prayer of repentance. Greatest we can pray. Amen? Any questions? Alright. So, Tonight, let's just take Jesus' model and let's pray Jesus' model, okay? And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask five people to stand and I'm going to ask you to pray specifically, pray us out on focused ways, all right? And so Bob, you, you pray for us first and what I'm going to ask you to pray specifically is I want you to just praise God for who He is, all right? Hallowed be Thy name, all right? Go ahead. Richie, will you pray and lead us in praying for God's will in our life?
Richard, if you would stand and just pray a prayer of thankfulness. Thank God for what He's given us, His provisions. Roland, will you lead us in prayer of forgiveness? Dave, you'll stand and finish in some prayer for deliverance. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we've had together tonight. Thank you for each and every person here. Pray, dear Lord, that throughout this week, God, that we would carve out times of prayer in our life. And Lord, we would have a closer relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray and we all said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.